thank you for joining us for another episode of 3D Printing Thursday. My name is Matthew, and I'm an engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. There are a variety of reasons for adding textures to your printed parts, from improving the gripping, traction of a surface, embedding metadata to the part, or just giving it an additional bit of life. You can find that adding textures does just that without having to make any major changes to your part's geometry. But in order to create great textures, there are some factors that must be accounted for, as well as understanding the methods behind texture generations. Now, we've talked in the past about adding textures to parts within SOLIDWORKS, but today we'll dive deeper into the topic, on different ways you can make a 3D texture, design parameters you should be accounting for, and when one method of texture generation is better than others. To start off, you should always account for the material and printer requirements to produce a clean texture. You don't want to make a beautiful design, only to find out that your printer's orientations, angles of the texture, and size is not possible on your part. This means you should plan ahead when designing your parts that you know textures will be used to avoid these mishaps and limit your design down the line. Some of these include reviewing your design guides for your printer to check the minimum size features that can be printed and appear on a part. Design the part to be printed in an ideal orientation, such as having textures vertical and text horizontally laid. Check for max print angles and offset features so supports are kept to a minimum. And finally, use a good layer height so your part does not show any stepping on the textures. With those design parameters identified, let's add some textures to a part within SOLIDWORKS. Once an initial model is made, we have two approaches to textures, using actual parametric features or the 3D texture tools within SOLIDWORKS. Parametric features for texturing is great if you have a unique texture shape or patterning large textured parts. These features can be added to the part via a sketch and wrap tool or just patterning and extrusion. The parametric method allows control over the exact size and shape of these textured features. For the part we'll be printing, however, we'll instead use the 3D texture tool. The main reason why is that for rounded objects like this, it may be difficult to create a pattern that follows normal to the surface and adjust the size of the features afterwards. By having a single mapping control, we can have the features larger or smaller without having to plan ahead on how the parametric feature pattern will adjust. We can see the placements of the texture right away as well using the grayscale photos. The 3D texture method has you use grayscale photos, which can be uploaded or found on the SOLIDWORKS' appearance tab to generate the pattern. These photos work by having black and white areas and gray spots in between. The texture is raised and lowered based off of those highlighted areas in white or black. Currently, we have the appearance wrapper on the entire front face, but if we want to restrict the space that this photo is applied to, we can use the split lines tool to separate our surfaces that the appearances sit on. By splitting our surface into two smaller areas, we can add new appearances to the part if desired in specific areas. Since these patterns are predefined from the photo, we only need to adjust the mapping instead of the texture itself to adjust the pattern. We can rotate, make these larger or smaller depending on our need, and our entire surface pattern adjusts based off of it. Now that our part has some appearances applied to the surface, let's turn these into textures. Inside of the Mesh tab, there is the 3D Texture tool that we can use just to do this. We can select on the solid body and see all the appearances populate the tool. Here, we can adjust a few settings related to how the part will be converted into a mesh file and a refinement of the grayscale photo that will be used to make the textures. There are some important factors we need to keep in mind at this point. The first being the refinement level, which affects how well our grayscale image is to be defined. As we increase this, we can see our facet counts going up and features becoming better defined. Having this slider higher is great, since that means that the mesh is going to be truer to our appearance from the grayscale image. We are adding more triangles or facets to ensure that the subtle changes of the grayscale images that are used to raise and lower the texture do appear. We're going to skip over the texture offset for now and adjust the element size next. The element size refers to the max edge size of the various facets making up our mesh. When it comes to mesh elements, facets, polygons, and triangles are all interchangeable terms, which can be confusing at times, but just remember that they are the small shapes that are creating and defining our mesh. We will want to adjust this before the texture offset, since we can fine tune how well defined the textures will be. As we decrease the max element size, our facet count rapidly increases, and the textures look significantly smoother. It's tempting to move the slider to the maximum setting to have the smallest sizes, 
but keep in mind that this edge count will be uniform throughout the part. If you have a larger part, you may have several million facets, which will slow your computer and may not be possible to import into a printer software. Vice versa, if you have this too low, our texture will not look great and print properly. Depending on your texture used, experiment with these refinements in element size sliders to get the best balance for the facet count and texture definition. With those two settings defined, we can now adjust the texture offset. Keep in mind those design parameters to ensure that the texture is not too far offset. Some textures and texts, depending on how small and subtle they are, may require having certain offsets to appear at all. You can adjust the size of the texture patterns or lettering to balance the offset and the ability for it to appear. Clicking the green check mark will generate the graphic body within SOLIDWORKS that we can now export as an STL for printing. If you wish to use the parametric feature method, we simply need to save the solid body as an STL in the File Save As options after we merged everything together into a single solid body. So far we've worked with some pretty simple shapes and textures, but what about organic ones? Ones that are very subtle in texture markings to make things like wood or an orange peel surface. For textures like this, we will need to reduce the spiked and sharp edges within the 3D texture tool. These sharp edges will be transferred onto our part, making it look lower in quality. To show off the differences, let's generate a paint smear texture on this part. Within SOLIDWORKS, we can see that the texture does appear, but with the spiked surfaces discussed earlier. If we zoom in close to an organic shaped texture, we can see that there are, again, several spiked surfaces and raised areas that don't really account for the organic shape we want. If you're looking to make this kind of texture for a print, we will need to use potentially a voxel mesh instead of a facet one. Voxels are volumetric facets, allowing for smoother transitions between the various triangles making up the mesh. Moving into a voxel modeler like Geometric Freeform, we can apply the same texture to the voxelized mesh at the same resolution. The preview we have is much smoother in the way that the texture appears. Even then, we can take this a step further instead of a voxel modeler and apply a global smoothing to the entire object. A balance between having the mesh be too smooth and our textures not appearing at all does require some experimenting with the settings. When we export this mesh, we'll keep the high resolution, making sure that the texture gives off the small, smooth finish that we want. So let's recap what we've discussed so far. One, keep in mind those printer settings to ensure that the texture will properly print without artifacts or incomplete sections. Know the limits that your software can use to generate textures. Some textures apply better in other softwares depending on the texture type and the way it's being applied and generated. Make sure that your mesh is exported at a high level of resolution so it does not become pixelated during the export phase. Instead of our slicing software, we can see a preview of how some of these design changes affects the part. Without proper angle identification and texture offset, we can see that supports would be needed throughout the entire part, and this would have a negative effect on the end look of it and might even lead to printing failures. After making some slight design changes to the supported areas and having a proper angle and texture offset, we can see that our part can now be printed without any supports. Using the proper tools and settings to create textures ensures that the quality comes out great every single time, reducing prototypes and gives you a better experience for your customer. Thank you for watching today's video. If you're interested in learning more printing tips, subscribe to our channel for our 3D Printing Thursday series, or for more videos on SOLIDWORKS, 3D scanning, and other engineering tools.